what I want to do for the next two days is completely open discussion. So if you have a question as we're going along, please just raise your hand, jump in. Um, don't wait. We're not going to set up specific question and answer periods. We want you to engage along the way. If you want to talk longer about a particular topic, we've got flexibility in our schedule. And if there are no questions or it doesn't seem relevant, we may go quickly through it. So this is, this is your training presentation, okay? So please engage. The first part of this morning, what I'd like to do first is give each of our team members who you're going to hear from a quick opportunity to tell you just a little bit about themselves so you know where we're going to be coming from as we give this training. Okay, so we all come to this training with different perspectives, with different experiences. So we want to give you an idea of where we're coming from so you can better understand um, kind of what our perspective is. And also, we're going to give you a quick overview of the NOAA Office of Law Enforcement. Why are we here? What do we do in the United States? And what is our role in combating IUU fishing and implementing the Port State Measure Agreement? Does that sound like a plan? Everybody okay with this? Okay, that's a yes or a no question. Well, you can go with a thumbs up, okay? We can go with thumbs up if you agree, thumbs down for no if you don't want to talk. Um, so, you, you were introduced to me a little bit before. So, my name is Todd, um, Todd Dubois. I'm the Assistant Director for the NOAA Office of Law Enforcement. I come to you from predominantly a fisheries law enforcement operational perspective. Okay, my entire adult career uh, for the last 30, 31 years has been in fisheries law enforcement. Okay, I started out in the United States Coast Guard. I did at sea boarding and inspection to the North Pacific. I was focused in, uh, I was stationed in Alaska. So a lot of our international uh, boundary operations, a lot of our work in the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska. Um, I liked fisheries enforcement enough um, that I wanted, and I like Alaska enough, that I wanted to stay there. So I left the Coast Guard and came over to NOAA enforcement to do full time fisheries enforcement. And I've been with NOAA enforcement for the last 26 years. I've um, been stationed in Alaska, where I dealt a lot with our enforcement up there, but also fisheries observer issues, and working with our fishery observer program to ensure the safety and data integrity from observers. Went to the East Coast and worked North Atlantic, and then I went to headquarters on a temporary assignment 10 years ago. So I'm not sure what the government's term of temporary is, but I am still at headquarters, and I've gotten more into policy and I'm responsible for counter IUU fishing and our port state measures implementation. So that's more than you probably needed to know about me, but it gives you an idea of where I'm going to be coming from for this training, where my perspective is. And I'd also ask Catherine to give you her perspective, or Dr. Patterson, to give you a different perspective of where she's going to be coming at, and then we'll go to the rest of the team. So, Catherine. Step one, technology. Selamat pagi, Saudika. Sorry for the other languages, that's all I have. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope to learn many more of your languages over the course of the week, but I do apologize that I've only gotten two down so far. So, my name is Kevin Patterson, and I'm a fair, foreign affairs specialist for the NOAA Office of Law Enforcement, and I'm also one of our certified law enforcement trainers. I actually come from a non-law enforcement background, unlike Todd and Brendan and others in this room. So I was never a fisheries inspector. I actually was a scientist, or am a scientist. So my previous research has focused on marine protected areas, as well as coral reef diseases, and marine mammals like bottlenose dolphins. So I came in to know about, this is my fourth year working for the Office of Law Enforcement, so I come from a scientific and academic background. I was a professor at a university and did a lot of curriculum development for my university. And so one of my primary responsibilities for the Office of Law Enforcement has been developing our enforcement training curriculum for combating IU fishing, as well as the port implementation of the Port State Measures Agreement. 
Um, when we're not doing capacity building, which is near and dear to my heart, because I used to live in Central America and Belize and worked with artisanal fisheries for about 10 years there, I am working on our policies, the U.S. government policies for combating any fishing from an enforcement perspective. So with that, I will hand it to Brandon. Hey everyone, how are you doing? This, uh, my name is Brandon Jamal, I'm, like I said, I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii. Honolulu, Hawaii is the 50th state in, uh, in the United States, but way down in the Pacific, so it's a small island, um, and we get a lot of fishing vessels, and so I'm here to talk to you about you know, what goes on in Hawaii, as well as all these, all those, uh, some of the other islands here. And uh, my background is, uh, I was a former, when I got out of college, I was a former customs inspector, uh, doing boardings and doing, checking for mostly drugs, money, drugs, money, and uh, other, other things. Uh, from the airplane, people coming off the airplane, or passengers, and as well as, uh, you know, boats, uh, marine interdiction. Uh, from there, I became an investigator for customs. So when the inspectors find something, then I would have to come out and do the, the investigation further. Who is this going to? Where is it coming from? Who, you know, what's the purpose of it here? Um, so that's my background. Then I went into fisheries. Uh, in 2008, about 11 years ago, I became uh, a special agent with the NOAA Office of Law Enforcement doing fisheries. And I had to learn a whole new subject matter. So I'm here to just speak to you about the what we do. And uh, I understand that um, it's, it's very challenging for you know, all the regions out there. So, um, But then, like I said, if you have any questions, please, like Todd said, please bring it up. And and we can just, uh, we're here to train. And that's that's our goal today. So. Okay. Uh, I'd like to bring in uh, Jill. Hi everyone, so my name is Jill Hamilton. I am an International Policy Fellow with NOAA and um, soon to be with the Department of State in the US, which works closely with NOAA OLE, just from a slightly different perspective. Um, so both states and I are doing a one-year fellowship uh, within the US federal government on ocean-related policy issues. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, my background is in international ocean policy and is predominantly focused in Latin America and the Caribbean before coming to NOAA. And essentially, in those roles, I worked with environmental uh, NGOs on um, ways that different countries could collaborate to tackle ocean-related issues uh, pertaining to marine protected areas, uh, fisheries management, particularly small-scale fisheries, and um, broader ocean diplomacy topics. So really excited to be here at NOAA, and with OLE I've learned a lot so far um, about fisheries enforcement, and so this is also really great and often new information for me as well. So next, and up next is Stacy. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good, good. Uh, I'm Stacey Warnstock. I'm the other fellow in the Office of Law Enforcement. Uh, really excited to be here. A little bit about my background. I'm also not from law enforcement, or as I like to affectionately call you all, fish cops. So <laughs> that's what I tell my little cousins that I'm a fish. I work for the fish cops. So, um, and I actually am also a scientist. My background is in fish and wildlife biology. I study fish specifically in the Caribbean. I went down there and I worked with invasive lionfish, which you all have over, not quite here, but nearby. And what we have them over in Florida where they're not supposed to be. So I did a lot of work on that. And I did a lot of teaching as well. I did a lot of environmental education. So I take people out on the water, teach them about fish, the ocean, the environment. Um, and that actually led me to graduate school where I did my graduate research on working with fishermen. So I actually worked with fishermen, with managers, fish managers, with NOAA, um, trying to kind of 
help them talk and help them learn and, and really learn more about what they like while they're fishing, what they need, what they're worried about, and sort of the more of the human side. And so I've come to OLE learning about international combating IU, and my work has been a lot of doing seafood import monitoring. So I work with the seafood trades with NOAA and helping with the training uh, and developing training for the growing seafood trade programs that NOAA is, is creating. So excited to be here and looking forward to learning more. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, guys. So I want to just take that little bit of time to, to give you a perspective. So we've got some scientific background, we've got policy background, we've got law enforcement background. So hopefully we bring a diverse group of folks to help here, and we're all learning from you. I have learned things all in the first two days, and I expect to continue to learn more from you. Our goal is to just give you some ideas of how we and others around the world are implementing port state measures. Some of these ideas may or may not work for you, and I'd like to hear from you your thoughts on whether some of these things will work or may not work for each of, of your countries. So please speak up. I know that we have some inspectors in the room, and I know that we have some policy folks in the room. I believe we have some lawyers in the room. So hopefully we want to bring all of these perspectives together. So I'm going to take a few minutes to talk to you about what the NOAA Office of Law Enforcement is. And it's really just designed to let you know who we are and what we do with Fisheries Enforcement for the United States and how we fit into the picture. Similar to the overviews that you each provided um, when, when you did your presentations uh, earlier in the week. So a couple quick things. I will likely use acronyms. And so acronyms, particularly when we're dealing in a language that is not your first language, can get challenging. Please stop me if I'm giving you acronyms that you don't understand. Okay? Um, I found myself in my early meetings constantly going to Google to try to find out what somebody said in a meeting. It's much easier to just ask as we're going along. A couple quick ones so that I, I know I'm going to say them. So NOAA is actually the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for the United States. You can see why we go with NOAA. NOAA is much cleaner. That is the actual home agency for us. And OLE is the Office of Law Enforcement. So I'll re refer to the Office of Law Enforcement often as just OLE. So those two will get out of the way. And we already know PSMA, so I won't have to worry about that. So NOAA OLE is the only full-time agency in the United States responsible for the law enforcement of our marine resource laws. Okay? We work closely with other agencies um, that we'll talk about, like the Coast Guard. They do at sea enforcement, but as you may be aware, they're a multi mission. Fisheries is only one of many things that they do. We focus on fisheries and fisheries law enforcement, marine resource protection. We've got uh, 53 field offices scattered throughout the United States. Um, obviously on the coast for the most part. We also have offices in our territories. As Brandon mentioned, um, territories of the Pacific, American Samoa, and Guam, we have law enforcement agents stationed there as well. But a lot of folks think that, gee, the United States, you must have plenty of resources, all kinds of people doing this enforcement. Um, we have about, my math won't be right, but about 130 um, overall sworn law enforcement personnel. That's our special agents, which are our plain clothes um, investigators, and our enforcement officers, which are uniformed patrol officers. They're often the ones doing the vessel inspections or the patrols in marked close for marked patrol boats. Okay? But our agents and officers do the same job. Um, just slightly different functions within it, but the same authority and jurisdiction. They have full police powers, so that is a little different than I think some of your countries, um, but that is uh, the function of our special agents and um, enforcement officers, our sworn law enforcement personnel. We also have 65 support staff, which are obviously, as all of you know, critical to our enforcement operations. But in particular, we have a fisheries analyst team, and we'll talk a bit about them, because similar to what we heard from Thailand yesterday, that Ocean Mind does some of their risk assessment, it's our 
fisheries analysts and our prime trade analysts that do our assessments and risk analysis. Okay, so pretty small team, that's only a five person team. It's okay. You're doing better than I did. Um, we currently have five full-time analysts at our headquarters office, and their focus is generally port state measures um, assessments. They look at the prior notice of arrival, or the AREPs, as you call them. We call them prior notice of arrival, PNOAs. Um, I'll try to refer to them as AREPs. It's the same thing. So they look at those, and they generally will provide an overview to the field agents and officers out in our field offices as to whether there's any intelligence or information that would make that a high level boarding, a medium, or a low risk boarding. So that's basically what they do in their function. They have very diverse backgrounds. We have former customs intelligence officers in our analyst team. We have um, one from the fugitive work with the marshal service. We have one that is done Coast Guard, yeah, we have a former Coast Guard intelligence analyst. So again, we try to get diverse backgrounds into our analyst team to look at these issues from different perspectives. And I, I will tend to get ahead of myself slides, so I've already covered this slide and what I just said. So, um, the US, I know many of you have huge exclusive economic zones, EEZs. Um, particularly with the island nations, very challenging. I know our colleagues, um, I know I've, I've done some work in Indonesia, Philippines, many of the island nations have large EZs, and similarly, the United States has a relatively large exclusive economics. Um, we work closely with the Coast Guard to deal with the 3.36 million square miles of open ocean. For us, we focus on the coastline, about 95,000 miles of coastline. We are also responsible for enforcement of our national marine sanctuaries, so our marine protected areas. Uh, there are 13 of those, as well as four national marine monuments, which we share enforcement jurisdiction with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And what we'll be talking about mostly today with port state measures and RFMO responsibilities, those are actually all fall within NOAA and the NOAA Office of Law Enforcement for enforcement of the issues surrounding those in collaboration with other agencies, but we're the lead agents. I'm not going to give you all of our statutes, um, but these are the ones, you'll, since you'll have this handout, I think it's a good reference for you. Um, our Magnuson Act, that first one, the Magnuson-Stevens Act, is our domestic enforcement statute, similar to many of your national fisheries laws. It establishes how we manage our fisheries resources, the domestic regulations and permitting over our domestic fleet, uh, the fisheries management measures. The other one that will be valuable, I think, to you, we'll talk a little bit about, um, and you may have an interest if you've ever heard of the Lacey Act, is effectively our best and one of our oldest statutes to deal with wildlife trafficking, and particularly comes into play with IU fishing, because what the Lacey Act does for us is any product that's imported into the United States that was harvested in violation of a foreign law is a violation of the Lacey Act. So we use, for example, the Philippines, a vessel harvests fish out of your waters illegally and then ships it to the United States, working together with the other end, we can then take action on those importing and seizing that product that arrives in the United States because it's taken in violation of, in that case, Philippine law. Same applies to all of you. Um, so it's a it's an important statute. It's um, used quite a bit in wildlife trafficking discussions as far as legal statutes that could be used in other countries. But that's the Lacey Act. Glad to talk to you more about that. Also have some case studies that we'll touch on tomorrow that involve the Lacey Act. And our Port State Measures Agreement Act um, 2015, that was our implementing legislation. And we'll talk about that a bit, but really it's very similar to what all of you are either have gone through or are going through to develop those practices necessary for you to carry out enforcement of the Port State Measures Agreement. So I'm just going to touch on a couple things on this slide, because our domestic enforcement program, which we're responsible for, is very similar to all of you. 
Okay? We do patrols and inspections and investigations. Because we are so small, we have established cooperative enforcement agreements. So we have joint enforcement agreements with all of our coastal states and territories, with the exception of one state. And basically, it, we provide federal funding and support for their enforcement officers at the state or territorial level to then enforce federal law. So we basically deputize them to carry out our priorities, and it's a force multiplier that allows those 130 of our sworn personnel to use the resources of the state conservation agencies and our territories to implement our laws or enforce our laws. And that includes port state measures, particularly in American Samoa and Guam, where those territorial officers are charged with enforcing the PSMA uh, along with our folks. One thing that I will touch on here is that the cooperation, I talked about Coast Guard, we work very closely with the Coast Guard, that connection between at sea enforcement and your shore side inspectors and investigators is critical. And hopefully that'll come through for all of you as well. You need to know what's going on at sea to do your job better at the dock and vice versa. So that cooperation and collaboration is a critical piece for us. It's connecting the at sea enforcement with the shore side and dock side enforcement and investigations. VMS, we've talked about, we'll talk more about that. Our vessel monitoring system in the United States is under the Office of Law Enforcement. So while it's used for many purposes, the VMS program itself is housed within the Office of Law Enforcement. And one thing that I want to talk about, and I think we'll hit on some more, is the need for our um, cases to have both civil administrative processes as well as criminal processes. And we've talked a little bit about that already but the importance of having both of those pieces. So our Office of General Counsel within NOAA prosecutes our civil administrative cases, handles seizures of fish and vessels, handles permit sanctions, and then our U.S. Attorney's Office handles criminal prosecutions of fisheries laws and crimes associated with high fishing. Uh, case 7. We'll talk. So, and I think we've already talked about my favorite vessel, the Banker and Percasa. So, we won't touch on that. That's we was moored up in Dutch Harbor, Alaska, under our custody for that year and a half to two years that we had to babysit that vessel until it could be destroyed. Um, so, our international law enforcement, obviously, we only enforce domestic law, and we don't we don't enforce international law, so to speak. But it comes our domestic law uh, comes from the international law. And when I talk about international law enforcement, I'm talking about those aspects um, in the United States that deal with the foreign connection. So whether it's products entering the United States, whether it's vessels on the high seas, whether it's IUU vessels, or whether it's our responsibilities and obligations under regional fishery management organizations. And then our trade monitoring, um, Stacy uh, touched on that a little bit. Uh, a lot more emphasis on product entering the United States, and that's where it's crucial for us to be able to partner with all of you and the work you're doing and port state measures. As we're monitoring fish coming off of these vessels, ideally to detect IU product at the first point, but anywhere along the supply chain, ideally we can work with you and make sure the product entering the United States or anywhere else in global commerce is legal. And that's why the job that you've been charged with and the Port State Measures Agreement is so important to our battle to combat IU fishing around the world and why we really need to work together. Because I can't tell when a container arrives in the United States whether it's legal or not, or whether it was taken illegally out of your EEZ or landed illegally in your country. So that's our partnership. We really want to emphasize that. And with that, um, talk very briefly about our technical assistance and our international cooperation. Um, in particular, well, we have the regional fishery management organizations, RFMOs. That's going to be the other acronym I'm going to use. I'm just going to stick to RFMO. Everybody good? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Hey, there we go. We've got to make you work a little, because otherwise I'm not sure I'm losing it. I don't, I don't want to put you to sleep. I know everybody's got jet lag and maybe stayed out late last night shopping and whatever else you had. <laughs> so stay with me. 
Um, we do, the United States does have specific binding agreements with the European Union to combat, to work together to combat IE fishing, as well as with Russia um, to, for information sharing to combat IE fishing. Um, we work within all of the RFMOs and we certainly have um, less formal agreements with many other countries, particularly many of you in this room where we work together. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a formal agreement. We do have a couple formal agreements. We have a lot of informal agreements as well. So I want to talk about our technical assistance program because it came up. I believe our colleague from the Philippines raised, you know, what are the, the capabilities and what do we do for capacity building? I think this is valuable. Um, we really appreciate the partnership with SeekDeck and all the work that SeekDeck is doing in the region and all of you are doing. We offer, along with many others, I know our colleague from AFMA, have, they have a training program um, and technical assistance, the FAO, um, and many others. So we know we're not the only ones out there doing it. It's something that we do take seriously. Uh, we've worked really hard at it and we want to continue to do that. So if there looks like there's an opportunity to partner with any of you, I want to at least put this up there as something that we should talk about in the next few days while we're all here together. Um, we have both a port state measures and inspector training program. We have counter IU fishing training program. Okay, a lot of overlap between those. Um, general monitoring, control, and surveillance, or MCS training. And we also do some work with uh, wildlife trafficking. We also are starting to develop, and still haven't formalized it, but the ability to do some investigative analysis. So our analyst team to help um, do some of that risk assessment. Still working on that program itself, but there's part of it in all of our training programs. And our partner agencies. USAID is a really big and important partner for us, particularly in the region here. Um, we also work with uh, the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, State Department, INL. Um, has been uh, increasing their support of our programs as well. And then FAO and the International MCS Network, which I mentioned briefly. Here's the OLE training modules. So the question of like what, what can we train, what can we provide? You will find that this tracks very closely with the Fort State Measures Agreement guidelines for inspector training. We literally touch on every required module um, within the agreement. Make sure I'm going on the right track. So, on your tables, you will notice that this morning we put out little folders, and so I just wanted to take a moment and highlight those. Um, I already saw some of you pulling it out as Todd was talking. So, the list of training modules can be found in that, as well as some of our example training agendas for each of our curriculum programs. So, that gives you more of a visual on what it is we're doing because our inspector training specifically you'll see that there's both classroom exercise and then about half of the training is conducting mock boarding so those would be the tables that actually have an example agenda this training program was created like Todd said based on the training guidelines and the annex E of the agreement and it's developed to be a menu of items so if your inspector training just for an example for your basic training for your inspectors already includes evidence collection, just as an example, then maybe that's not something that your country would desire out of it. So we basically designed our programs to be a menu so that countries can pick their most priority needs and training modules to be able to have a customized program. But all of those examples and a little bit more information about our program can be found in the folders we provided this morning. Thanks, Catherine. And that, that really does help because we can tailor our program. That's why we developed it in modules. So effectively, you only need 10 of the 20 modules or however many or 18 modules. Then we can tailor your training for your group to be focused on just those pieces. And we do try to do our training, our in-country training, specific to your laws as well. So if we're going to talk about evidence collection, we'll incorporate your legal frameworks and typically lawyers or others from your own countries to help us with, so what are the things that have to be done to make sure we're, we're keeping in compliance with your legal requirements rather than, we're not just giving you like a US perspective. This is a tailored to, to each individual country. 
So here's our Port State Measure Training Workshops. Um, some of you in the room may not be aware that we are working in some of your countries and you may or may not be aware. That's important for us to know so that we can better communicate. Um, in particular, uh, I think our longest standing relationship in the region is with Indonesia on Port State Measures. We've been working with Indonesia for um, several years and we also have started working on um, biennial with uh, the Philippines, so BFAR is involved in our training. We've done a couple, we've done one port state measures and a couple previous IUU and port state measures trainings. Um, but we also have coming up um, Thailand and Vietnam, increasing partnerships with both of those countries and have scheduled training in both or at least tentative scheduling. So we are working with those countries. This is not to uh, slight anyone, anyone in here that's interested we're glad to, to talk with you about how we might be able to be of support, or one of our other partners may be able to be, whether it's AFMA or FAO or others. So it's something to, to consider. Um, you can see these are, these are basically the different trainings that we've done fairly recently or have upcoming. Um, yeah, for the rest of this year, we do have, we have Indonesia training, we have tentative Thailand training, um, Vietnam, the Philippines, and Peru are all coming up between now and about six months from now, so most of them within the next six months. While ours is focused on the operational inspector, how do I board a vessel in accordance with the agreement? So they're slightly different. We have been in contact with FAO, and I will welcome Zhao's um, comments if he would like to add anything. With FAO in Rome, we did, I think, the assessment initially, and we just haven't worked out exactly how the coordination is going to be, but Catherine may have better insight. To optimize the attacking cost for the hunting pounds of both zebras. Good question. A very good question. Um, honestly, at this stage, we would welcome the request to come straight to NOAA. Now that said, often U.S. aid offices or our INL offices and the embassies in the appropriate countries may be able to facilitate that as well. And I don't know if our colleagues from USAID or INL want to add anything out of this stage. So, but you can send it direct to any of us. I'm going to put our contact information up there, and we can coordinate. Uh, I will say, in all honesty, we're we're fairly stretched for the rest of this year. So any training would definitely we'd be looking at 2020 forward. But we are glad to discuss with any member in here how we might be able to be of assistance, whether it's a port state measure or broader counter IUU. Okay. Catherine? No? Well, one thing to share something? Certainly. Out here. Certainly. Okay. Thank you. So um, just talking about how their uh, member countries can reach out to NOAA. So, um, I am from INL, we work for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement from US Embassy in Hanoi. And uh, the reason why I'm here during this training, like the first purpose is that we just want to look for more, you know, um, how can I say, opportunities to involve working with NOAA and then we will see our needs assessment of Vietnam fisheries of any force or director of, director of fisheries and then after that we will connect and then we will fill in the gap, bringing the NOAA experts to Vietnam to conduct more trainings. And uh, in line with this one, in October this year, um, U.S. Embassy IA in Hanoi will be bringing the senior delegation from Vietnam Fisheries Surveillance Force or Directorate of Fisheries to the United States. And then we will be taking them to NOAA headquarters and also side office and uh, we're working and then we're exploring the technical assistance that NOAA might provide for Vietnam. So. Thank you. Any other questions? See, I may just throw you at saying you've got a question. I don't want to tell you you've got a question. Okay. Uh, any other questions on our training? This is just our broader, where we've done OLE, um, the counter IUU training. So again, this is, this is really just designed to let you know the different places that we are working. It's broad-based. Um, but we have a lot of partners, and I want to echo that. I know, again, AFMA, FAO, all doing different types of training, and could also be resources. Did you want to add anything, Brendan or Zhao? Uh, I, might, I might add something very quickly. 
Um, yeah, in the same, in exactly what Todd said there, um, AFMA does have, uh, I guess, board state measures training, working in the same vein as uh, NOAA OLE, um, so board and inspection training. We will be looking to, uh, I guess, increase our capacity going forward in the ASEAN region, um, and that will include uh, inspection training, board inspection training along uh, board state measures, etc. So I don't have any specifics on what that will look like right now, um, but going forward, um, more than happy for anyone to take my card, contact myself, um, and we'll see what we can do going forward. But we're also looking um, through this project to work very closely with NOAA, OLE, and FFA um, on this program. So uh, more than happy to answer any questions going forward. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning, all. Um, yes, FAO has been uh, doing capacity building and what we try to avoid at the moment is to duplicate efforts, which means that we try to coordinate with our partners to understand what each other are doing and try to not duplicate the effort. So if NOAA is doing something on the operational side, we'll try to do legal side or institutional side. So that's rationalize the support. And on the other hand, there is also an important issue, is that FAO should not uh, advise countries on how to interpret an international agreement. It looks like a small detail, but it's a very important detail. Uh, each port state is sovereign in its interpretation or strict application of the agreement. So, we can talk about best practices, we cannot tell you how to do it. So that's, it looks like a tiny little difference, but it's an important difference. So that's why it's important to talk with your partners, meaning the neighboring countries, in order to get a more homogeneous way of procedures. But uh, it's something that FAO should not be involved, is how to interpret an international agreement. We, we may say from the point of view of international law what it means, how you do it in practice, it's under your sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you. Very important point. Okay. okay. So, one thing that one to break up the monotony of me talking at you and throwing PowerPoints up there, but also to highlight. Um, Again, a long-standing relationship we've had in the region, and not to single a particular country out, but just a, a long partnership. And USAID um, was kind enough to put together a short video on the capacity building, technical assistance, and partnership that we've had with Indonesia. So I'd like to go ahead and just show that just a short clip. Um, hopefully that'll be useful to you, but it, it just highlights the efforts um, of Indonesia to combat IU fishing and also our partnership through USAID and NOAA to do some technical assistance training with um, the fisheries inspectors, the surveillance folks in Indonesia. pada perikanan Indonesia di mana beliau juga memastikan kedaulatan itu ada pada perikanan Indonesia di mana beliau tetap menutup larangan investasi asing kapal asing nelayan asing untuk menangkap ikan di perairan Indonesia mandat bagi Kementerian Kelautan dan Perikanan telah jelas adalah melaksanakan Pemberantasan kegiatan illegal fishing di seluruh wilayah perairan Indonesia. And the Port State Measures Agreement, being a fairly new international agreement, 
has led us to create both a training program domestically as well as for our international partners. So we've been working on this with USAID for the last three years as well as NMAF. And in fact, our first pilot training program was held in Monado in August of 2016. We're working with the training center here in Indonesia to ideally make it so it's a national training program for them so that NOAA has built the program in collaboration with Kakape and the training center. And then moving forward would be more of a train the trainer and NOAA would step back and be an observer and ultimately step away as Indonesia continue the program on their own. So the Port Tip Measures Inspector Training is comprised of both classroom sessions as well as mock boring exercises. In the classroom, we go from formal lectures, reviewing the information, and providing best practices from the theory perspective. And we also have some classroom exercises where our participants start engaging in actual information analysis. Today we're here at the port of Marabaru. We cover topics such as evidence collection, information analysis, how to compare documents against one another to detect anomalies, as well as boarding and inspection procedures. And so now our participants are here actually conducting the mock boardings and going through a scenario that our boarding team has developed where they are detecting IU fishing violation. Yang sangat berkesan untuk saya adalah IMO, bagaimana kita mengetahui IMO nampil itu betul atau tidak. Kemudian cara cepat uh, mengestimasi muatan kapal itu sangat berarti untuk kami di lapangan. Nah, sekarang saya baru tahu bahwa sebenarnya metode pemeriksaan yang kita lakukan terhadap kapal itu seperti apa. Tidak hanya dokumen saja, tidak hanya alat tangkapnya juga, tapi kita tuh mewawancara terhadap metode. Banyak informasi yang kita gali di situ. Salah satunya terkait dengan melakukan kegiatan penangkapan di mana, jenis tangkapan spesinya apa, alat tangkap tangkap apa yang digunakan, dan metode pemeriksaan pun lebih bagus. Sehingga kita tidak hanya memeriksa terhadap satu bagian saja, tapi bagian-bagian lain kita periksa secara keseluruhan. United States to the U.S. Agency for International Development partners with the government of Indonesia to ensure effective implementation of the Port State Measures Agreement. By putting the agreement into action, we are sending a strong signal to those engaged in IUU fishing that they are not welcome in American or Indonesian ports. IUU fishing threatens our fisheries resources, maritime security, livelihoods, and global food security. We look forward to continuing our joint efforts, information sharing, and law enforcement cooperation in this area for the benefit of both of our countries. Pengawasan sumber daya kelautan dan perikanan yang baik dan benar akan mewujudkan kedaulatan, keberlanjutan, dan kesejahteraan bagi masyarakat seluruh Indonesia, khususnya bagi nelayan Indonesia. Oleh sebab itu, ayo kita bersama laksanakan pengawasan sumber daya kelautan dan perikanan setiap saat, dimanapun, di wilayah negara kesatuan Republik Indonesia. So that, that gives a little bit of an overview. Um, so we really appreciate that USAID uh, was able to put that together. I think a lot of it is, is most, what I tried to show you there is the fact that our training focuses on that, both classroom, tabletop exercises, but a lot of boardings. We do a lot of training in the morning in the classroom and go to the vessel and do scenarios on the vessel. Um, so the goal is that an inspectors coming out of the training, which is an eight day training program, They'll basically have done mock inspections, and so they'll be prepared to actually board um, real vessels. Uh, but I know many of you are already doing this. So what we can offer would be more um, build on what you already have and give you another set. As, as Joe mentioned in particular, um, we give you our perspective on what best practices are from a fisheries law enforcement perspective. Brandon this afternoon is going to talk about health and safety, how to do uh, boardings effectively, how to do them safely, things to be concerned about, how to gather evidence and information. So that's where we're trying to get to. And I'm hoping that that's relevant to all of you here, at least from a thought process side. That's where we're coming at it from as an operational perspective. So here's our points of contact. No problem. Um, for all of you to be aware of, rather than necessarily try to find individuals, that bottom email address, the noaa.oele.international, 
Um, that is checked by multiple people on my team, and that email address is good. If you just need assistance, say we've got a vessel, you got any ideas on how we can find the ownership, or you know, this is a vessel. In fact, Thailand has been very uh, effective sending us emails asking, you know, this vessel was offloaded to one of the carrier vessels that came in, and we would like to know is this catch accurate? Is this reflected? It allows us to go back and check those records and provide feedback. But that's a good email address to just reach out and get some assistance from us, or at least get some initial contact, and then we can put you in touch with the right person to help with that. So that's enough about NOAA. The rest of the day is going to be focused on port state measures. But um, at this stage, any questions, comments, concerns? Here we go. Thank you very much. Maybe I want to ask a question about the importance of Indonesia. So NOAA is uh, already present uh, two years at the NOAA, at the Indonesia place. So uh, can you compare before and after? And how depiction between before and Indonesia present the PSMA and after the NOAA include at the Indonesia Republic. So, how efficient? The efficient is, I mean, is uh, hours, many hours, and, and, uh, and uh, possible anything. I mean. Sure, and, and I may ask our Indonesian colleagues to comment on that um, if they'd like, but initially, what I can say is part of our training program and our cooperation through USAID um, with the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries in Indonesia included not only the training, but assistance with developing their training program. So that again, this next training that we're going to do in Indonesia is going to be mainly conducted by Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries instructors, and folks that have come through the training program through curriculum that we assisted in the development, but they've developed an Indonesian training program that's done by their training ministry now, and it's their own standalone training program. Um, it's based on some of what we did, but builds on what they need to do internally and their own and their own country training needs. Uh, we also agreed to assist them with standard operating procedures, and so we have worked with the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries um, to assist with their their um, standard operating procedures and operational implementation, as well as we did have a training workshop. Um, with multiple ministries in Indonesia to assist um, the discussion of interagency cooperation, interministry cooperation. Um, I can't necessarily speak to how effectively all of these things have been. I know that from our perspective they've been very successful, but I would offer maybe our Indonesian colleagues to add a comment if they've seen a difference before and after the training or so I now they got to decide who's going to get to talk. Okay, thank you, Doug. Uh, good morning. Uh, sorry, Doug. The comparison in Indonesia before and after China is saying, but I have a regulation in state of before training base M. After training base M, we now hold the function of the server, our master, is the top size. If the implementation is M, we must mark regulation. Let's give a three. The implementation system is the rule. And the problem, the problem with me, in Indonesia, there are PC ports and transport ports. Transport port is a ministry of transport. PC port is a ministry of marine and fisheries. It's a very different ministry. This is my 
for my company. And now, we might uh, minister the to implement the same basic regulation and uh, minister the green uh, join and uh, take in air with ministry transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Okay. Mr. Stewart, thank you for your presentation. We got to know about the activities of OLD and all. Uh, I have two silly questions. We were talking about the uh, satellite based VMS in the US. What are the category of vessels do you have there? Like, whether it is you know going for one day fishing or multi day fishing or big uh, industrial vessels? All three. So we have single day fisheries. We have multi-day fisheries and we have large factory processor fishing vessels, particularly in the northern Pacific. So it, it varies around the country depending upon the fishery. Not all have BMS requirements, but the majority of our commercial fishing vessels now have BMS requirements on them. Just like in Hawaii, Hawaii has commercial fishing. If you're a recreation private fishery, you don't have In Hawaii, if you're a commercial longliner permitted with the fishing service, you would have BMS access and BMS on the boat. We don't monitor the recreational private fishing vessel. Person wanting to go out to fishing and doing trolling, we don't monitor that. Um, so it's we have a challenge too. We don't monitor all the fisheries, only a certain size. Uh, when you don't monitor such vessels, there's a risk of uh, harvesting. There is always wildlife which are concerned to be particularly endangered. Or yes, there's always a risk. There's always a risk. Right. But that's why we, uh, from zero to three miles, we have our partners that that uh, they enforce those the state rules, uh, and they 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 keep a lookout on the private fishing vessels. Thank you. Sorry, can I just add from an Australian perspective, just very quickly? Um, in exactly the same vein as what Brandon just said, um, Australia doesn't, recreational fishermen, so people going out for their personal use, getting fish to eat, etc., um, we don't monitor that. That is a state fishery, as Brandon said, and it's exactly the same in Australia. So, state fisheries are responsible from zero to three nautical miles. Um, but from a commercial perspective in Australia, every single vessel in Australia that is a commercial vessel must have VMS on board. And that VMS is monitored 24-7. They are allowed to manually report and we will, we will set up a, um, basically a time frame. We might say to them every hour you need to report your location.